I'm a evolutionary microbiologist, I guess is what I would call myself. So uh, we use mainly genome sequences and metagenomics of different bacterial and viral pathogens, as well as microbial communities. Um, so ranging from uh, freshwater lakes that are impacted by cyanobacterial blooms to the human gut, um, focusing on people infected with cholera um, and working on a variety of different infectious diseases, mostly bacteria, um, and through the um, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, got more involved in viral work as well. But I basically take a, uh, the uh, ecology and evolution lens um, on microbial populations and communities. Okay, that's very interesting. So can you tell us a bit more then about the COVID wastewater project that you're involved in? Yeah, so I'm humbled to be sort of, and, and a little daunted to be uh, representing this really big project that, that really is um, a big team effort by the Centro group, which is a big group of um, uh, a multidisciplinary group, mainly water and wastewater engineers, um, civil and environmental engineers, which I, I am not. I'm, I'm, I'm clearly uh, a, a genomics person. Uh, so that's sort of my angle on it is actually looking at the, the sequence data that comes out of it. But uh, it's a big project across Quebec um, that harness an existing network of water researchers and water quality researchers who already had been looking at pathogens um, in um, in water and wastewater and, and that sort of organized and sprang into action uh, during the pandemic. So these are researchers at uh, Université Laval, uh, as well as McGill, uh, Polytechnique, Montreal, um, and across the province. So um, I can't do justice to all the different research that, that went into this, but really it was a big effort um, getting samples, optimizing at the level of sample collection and processing and all kinds of um, hydraulics and engineering processes that I, I barely understand, um, but all feeding into quantifying levels of SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater um, and also sequencing, which is that's the part that I was more involved in um, to, to try to get a, a picture of um, how much virus is circulating in a given catchment area municipality or even neighborhood um and uh and what what lineages so are there are there variants of concern are there differences between regions and, and trends over time so things like that right so maybe could you explain a bit about how sequencing specifically plays a role in in those pieces that you were just describing yeah so i guess that the 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 main output or 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 at least the um I'll venture to say easier um, output, even though there's a lot that goes into this as well, is just the quantification of virus in wastewater. So how, how many viral copies? So this is with a quantitative PCR assay. Um, uh, and, and this is done, I would say more routinely um, across many, many different locations in the world. And this is using conserved primers across the viral genome just to see how, you know, how much is, is there. Um, and that's, of course, really important just to follow the epidemic uh, peaks and, and, and valleys um, and is generally thought to be a leading indicator so that it'll start to, to go up before um, we see a lot of cases in hospitals. So I think that this can be really valuable. Um, the sequencing component is a bit trickier or certainly more costly and time consuming where we're actually going to uh, take those PCR products, so samples that are qPCR positive, and try to sequence um, what's in there. So it starts as RNA, but we turn it into DNA and, and do shotgun sequencing. So um, because this is wastewater, so imagine, um, I guess, depending on the catchment, right? So, you know, that uh, people have been doing this at, on airplanes and airports, or you could do it for a single household um, or a hospital or kind of a small area. We've been focusing so far primarily on larger catchments like the city level. So there's like two major interceptors for the wastewater in Montreal, north and south. So obviously it's sampling, you know, maybe half a million people or something like that. Similarly for Laval or Quebec City. So it's a big mixture of all the viruses that are being shed. So it's kind of saying at a population level, what's there. And that um, the qPCR will not give you that information. It'll say 
how much virus, but it won't tell you the mixture of which variants of concern. Are there different um, uh, mutations that that we may not have seen before that could be interesting? Um, so it, it can give a sense of like, for example, and the, the beginning of the, the Omicron wave um, in uh, um, January or December uh, 2021 into January 2022, you know, is is Omicron here yet? Are we seeing it? You know, we can get an early indicator um, from wastewater by sequencing um, and potentially be able to detect new variants or new mutations that, that we haven't seen before. So that's kind of the, the idea. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> oh, amazing. That's really interesting. So, I mean, in terms of just where the project is at now, like how long has this been up and running and what are some of the lessons that you've learned so far in the work? Yeah. So um, we started with a, a pilot that ran, um, I'm going to get the exact dates wrong, uh, roughly in the uh, tw over 2021, let's say I can, I should be able to, every, everything's a blur in, in pandemic time, but we ran that um, as a pilot in uh, with samples uh, from Montreal, Quebec City and Laval, which are the three major uh, metropolitan areas in Quebec. So I think it's a pretty good place to start. Um, and, you know, it was sort of a proof of concept that we could do it. We, we can sequence and get pretty good genome sequence data from wastewater, which in and of itself is is a challenge. And, and there was a lot of work done by Yanis Ragusis at, at the McGill Genome Center as well and team uh, to optimize these methods because um, it's a big pool of viruses, but the viral genomes are often really, the RNA gets really degraded as it's kind of, you know, these are not live viruses. It's pa it's passing through the whole, you know, through the toilet into the wastewater and coming out the other end. And often it's been treated um, in, in treatment plants, all this kind of stuff. So it's not evident to get out good quality RNA. So just to show that we could do that, um, even if the data is a little bit messy, we're still able to um, identify mutations and identify combinations of mutations that give us pretty good evidence for a particular variant of concern, say alpha, delta, omicron, um, and, and so on. So we showed we could do that, um, that there is a, a pretty good level of concordance with the, the, vir the, uh, the viral sequences from clinical sampling. So at the time, you know, um, in, in that earlier part of the pandemic, people would go in and get nasal swabs for a PCR test. This is kind of before rapid tests went out and a, a sampling of those would be sequenced. So we could see how, how well um, does wastewater match that sampling. And it's pretty well, um, not exactly the same. And we expect there to be different biases. Um, I think this might, might be jumping into your next question, but in the future, we want to kind of understand, um, are there systematic biases in wastewater? Um, how much of that is in the sample processing? Um, how much is bioinformatics? Um, and, you know, what would be great to really know is if there is a discrepancy of if there's a particular variant or particular mutation that we tend to be seeing more in wastewater compared to in hospitals, if that's really true, um, is that because there really are viral lineages that are circulating more in the population, but actually don't make their way into the hospital, so are less virulent or vice versa, right? Where there's particular mutation or a particular uh, variant lineage that is really enriched in the hospital population. So that might actually be, you know, give uh, worse disease outcomes and, and things like that. So it's still hard to distinguish that from other, from other sources of noise and bias in just the wastewater sampling process. But we're uh, trying to understand that I think as part of, that's a, a challenge going forward. Great. And that's really interesting. Yeah, go on. <laughs> I, I think I was going to say, yeah. So I think I, I sort of answered two questions two questions at once. What did we learn and, and where are we going? Um, um, some other other examples of that um, definitely are at the level of the, the catchment as well is, you know, if you zoom into lower levels of resolution down at the neighborhood level versus the sort of citywide level, um, can you get more information? Um, there could also be different levels of RNA degradation as well, where maybe the RNA isn't as degraded if you're sampling it, you know, right as it's coming out of 
um, you know, a, um, aggregate living um, uh, um, uh, establishment or a hospital or something like that versus all the way at the end of the whole network where it's like in the water treatment plant and, uh, and, and things like that. Um, yeah. And I, so I, and I think we're, you know, as this progress, as this project progressed, we started with our own, uh, kind of home coded method for doing all the bioinformatics and identifying mutations and variants of concern. So, you know, kind of constellations of mutations, um, as the project progressed, there's, we've been in touch with people all around the world doing similar stuff. And so there, we've been trying out different methods and are now using more of, uh, I, I think standards are um, starting to emerge. So we're comparing these different methods to each other. Um, so I think we're kind of coming to better consensus of, you know, what's the, the best way to, to do this. And I think we're, um, we're getting closer. Great, amazing. So I don't know if you've been asked this question before, but is there a need to continue this work in terms of COVID? Um, I think you do hear a lot yeah. of people saying it's not over, even though, yeah. you know, the de declarations yeah. have been made. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, it's a, we're, we're lucky. Um, we're, I mean, it's, or we're more than lucky. You know, we worked hard uh, to get this pandemic under control and and get vaccines out. And so things, things are better. It's no longer an emergency, but it's still, it's still there. So it's not, uh, it's not something to be ignored um, the same way that, you know, flu or cholera, which is another, you know, we're, we're still in a cholera pandemic, right? It's not an emergency for uh, most people, but it is for many, many people around the world. So it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not, it's not something to ignore. Um, and in that sense, wastewater is really, really good because inexpensively and non-invasively, um, we can keep, um, an eye on things and, and, and keep, um, tracking new variants. Um, are there variants that are, are growing in prevalence? Um, are there mutations that might be escaping immunity? Um, and we can, get a lot more data without everyone having to go in and get a nasal swab. Um, and if the people who are getting nasal swabs that are sequenced tend to just be severely sick people in the hospital, wastewater uh, provides a more, um, uh, or I should say unbiased, or at least a differently biased um, a sample of the population um, that is non-invasive and is quite cheap. Because if you think of you know, se sequencing one wastewater sample, depending on the catchment, that could be the equivalent of, of sampling like a thousand people. Um, right. And, and, and so kind of pooling that all together, um, even if the, the, the sequence, the, uh, the data analysis is maybe a little less straightforward to deal with that mixture. It's a really rich source of data that can be quite inexpensive and definitely non-invasive. So I think it's a, it's a really good way to go, um, to keep up this surveillance work without, you know, without bothering people to go and, get sampled and uh and things like that that said i don't think it replaces individual um sampling either because of course if you sample an individual you actually you can learn about their symptoms you can learn about their you know their immunology and and i think there's real value to that too so i i, I don't think wastewater uh, replaces everything but i think it's a really good complement even during sort of non-emergency pandemic times um and it's a tool um that that um, can be applied to other pathogens as well. I know that people have um, detected polio in in wastewater. Um, you know, it can be applied to lots of different things. Looking for um, antimicrobial resistance genes um, from bacteria, things things like that. So I think it is a really uh, useful tool, and I think the pandemic has spurred a lot of movement in in this area. And I hope we can uh, keep the momentum and uh, keep it keep it going. Great. Yeah. Are you able to combine um, like various pathogens into one test or do they have to be done sort of separately? Yeah, I think the ideal is it's that's a great question. Um, I think that potentially, you know, you can do shotgun sequencing, either, you know, total RNA or total DNA um, in, in just a purely discovery mode. Um, trouble with that, it's a bit of a needle in a haystack problem is you'll end up sequencing a lot of things that you might not really care about and of course, and then analyzing and pulling apart that data is is complicated so i think it is useful to go in with some some targets uh because then you can either by pcr or or um 
some other technology, you can sort of pull out what you're interested in in order to analyze it in more detail. And that tends to be the strategy that people use for you know, a virus of interest or a panel of antimicrobial resistance genes that are of concern. Um, that said, I think there is a value of just sort of pure discovery. You know, every every hundredth sample, you just shotgun sequence to see, may, you know, maybe we're going to discover something new. But of course, you know, it, it's hard to, um, and, and that can be valuable for sort of populating databases. On the other hand, um, you know, you there's lots of different viruses and, and variants of those viruses um, that it can be dizzying. And, and there's a lot of things that we probably don't care about because there's, there's tons and tons of viruses. There's plant viruses, uh, animal viruses in, in wastewater all mixed together. Um, so I think it is it is good to go in with some some priorities and not um, not just be totally overwhelmed with data that we don't exactly know what to do with. For sure. So what are, what are your hopes for for the future of this work? And is there anything else you wanted to add to? Yeah, I mean, um, I I hope it continues. I think it's real. I it's inherently uh, multidisciplinary. So as I said, you know, there are all these um, uh, uh, engineers and people do who understand the water systems and the flow rates and degradation rates and real engineering um, considerations. Um, I'm more on the genomics and, and, uh, uh, sequence analysis side of things, but it's really great to have these people talking to each other and learning from each other to kind of put it all back together, um, into something that makes sense. Um, not to mention also, you know, matching up wastewater data to clinical data and, and you using this data to actually inform epidemiological models and, and and predictive models and things like that. So it really spans um, all these different disciplines. And I think it's just super useful to have all those people in conversation together. Um, yeah, in terms of, you know, other applying it to other, other, um, other pathogens, I think that, you know, the sky is the limit um, about, you know, what, what would be a, a priority. Uh, people are talking a lot about um, AMR, um, antimicrobial resistance, which is something that, um, Ha has been on researchers' radar uh, and you know clinicians to some extent is this sort of slow train crash of, of, of a crisis um, that got superseded by the very fast cr train crash of the the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, but now we can bring back focus to these you know more more long term uh, problems and uh, to deal with things before they become uh, a major issue. And any plan, any plans for like interprovincial work, like in terms of tracking, there's so much movement between the provinces, any, anything like that in the future? Yeah. So this also is a big, um, challenge and an opportunity, um, is that, um, so far provinces are mostly working separately, but there is an initiative at the pub, uh, at the public health agency of Canada. People are in conversation with each other. Um, I'm part of a network, um, called Covarnet. Um, which um, also as a mission wants to bring data together, um, move towards open data and data sharing. Um, and there's a lot of progress made specifically for um, clinical samples. So um, virus sequences from you know individual people. Um, we made a lot of progress in getting that data generated and shared openly so everyone can see it. Um, getting all the provinces to um, to to work together and share, and I think there's you know benefit to everyone because of course you know it's all it's all linked. Um, there's is you know transit across provinces. Provinces are a bit different in terms of their um, their policies and their sort of travel um, connections and, and things like that. Um, we're not we're not there for for wastewater yet, but it's that's a major goal is, is to move towards more. Um, open data sharing and sort of having data portals and dashboards where you can kind of see it all together in one place. Um, but it's a, it's a bit of a slow process and involves, you know, um, uh, soft skills, I guess. It's not, it's not just science. You got to work with people and, um, and, and, um, uh, provincial public health labs and everyone has their own way of doing things and their own interests and, and, uh, and things like that. So we're hoping to, move more in that direction. 
Amazing. That's that sounds great. Well, thank you so much for for taking the time to to talk with us and to share this with CGEN's community. Is there anything else? Any last words that you want to share? No, I think you know. Uh, just next time you use your your toilet and uh, if, or if you walk down the street and look at a sewer, just think of the uh, you know river of of DNA and RNA, and it's uh, just all the information that's flowing through there, just waiting to be uh, tapped. So I think it's pretty. Pretty amazing. So I'll leave you with that thought. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Take care. My pleasure. Thanks. Bye.